Hello, it's uh, Gavin Wood here from uh, RMIT University in Melbourne, Australia. Uh, I've been asked to talk about uh, paying mortgages, housing market stability and tenure flexibilities. My plan is to initially uh, talk about the evolution of uh, home ownership in Australia from the early 1900s, to describe the home ownership tenure and its characteristics as we entered uh, 2020. And then I'm going to look at the implications of uh, COVID for the owner-occupied uh, housing sector and perhaps some longer term uh, repercussions as well. OK, let's begin uh, by looking at the historical origins of today's homeownership tenure in Australia. Even in the early 1900s, uh, Australia had a relatively high home ownership rate had reached uh, 50% by the early 1900s. But one key event at that time which helped set Australia on a path to a dominant home ownership uh, system, housing system, was the introduction of the age pension in 1907. Uh, unlike uh, most other countries uh, in Europe, Australia introduced a means-tested age pension rather than a universal age pension. Uh, it also introduced an age pension which was at a relatively low level by comparison to average earnings in the economy. This implied that most Australians had to save during their working lives in order to attain a reasonable standard of living in retirement. Uh, as uh, as uh, lives lengthened, as longevity improved, so that saving during working lives became more and more important. Home ownership and owner-occupied housing was an obvious vehicle for wealth accumulation during uh, working lives. And the attractions of owner-occupied housing as a vehicle for wealth accumulation were heightened by a whole series of fiscal concessions. And let me just run through some of those. Originally, when the age pension was introduced, as I mentioned, it was means tested. And in fact, unoccupied housing assets were part of that means test. They were very quickly removed, 1912. Net imputed rents on unoccupied housing were taxed under the Australian income taxation system, but removed in 1923. Unoccupied housing was exempted from land taxes in the 1950s. And when capital gains tax was introduced in 1985, unoccupied housing was awarded an exemption. Concessions on stamp duties to first home buyers have been in evidence for many years now, and periodically during economic slowdowns, the value of those concessions has been increased. Finally, means-tested aged care charges extend generous concessions to the housing wealth of owner-occupiers. When you add up all those fiscal concessions, it means or implies that unoccupied housing is ex an extremely attractive asset for Australians to acquire. But in addition to those fiscal concessions, there were direct interventions that were particularly important in the period after the Second World War. So, for example, government-owned savings banks directed cheap mortgage loans <coughs> to middle and uh, low-income uh, home buyers, albeit uh, rationed. Infrastructure for greenfield sites were cross-subsidised from the rates paid by established property owners. By the 1980s, most Australians could anticipate linear housing careers. That is, following departures from the parental home, it was typical to have a spell in private rental housing while a deposit is saved. Purchase of a home with a mortgage and down payment commonly coincided with marriage and starting a family before trading up to accommodate growing space needs. As retirement beckoned, so mortgages were paid off and almost all Australian owner-occupiers entered their retirement years free of debt and with almost no recurrent housing costs. So home ownership became widely regarded as an important pillar supporting the living standards of Australians in retirement. And by international standards among OECD countries, 
poverty rates among the elderly on Australia are relatively low on an after housing cost basis, despite government age pensions that are low by OECD standards. Well, there are three key developments in the 1980s and 1990s that have transformed those secure linear housing careers and have shaped the course of the homeownership tenure in Australia through to 2020. Those three key developments are deregulation of financial markets and the emergence of global capital markets, the deregulation of Australian labour markets, and thirdly, the introduction of the superannuation guarantee in 1992. This is uh, a scheme based on uh, one introduced in the Netherlands in the 1950s, whereby employers are obliged to contribute a minimum percentage, currently 9.5%, of eligible employees' earnings to a complying pension fund. While regulation of housing financial, in financial institutions had helped restrain house prices, but their relaxation in the 80s unleashed a surge of mortgage funds helped along by, interna by lower international barriers to global capital. Home buyers were therefore better able to take advantage of the tax concessions to ownership and banks slackened their lending criteria, one of the most important of those being the admission of second earner income in assessments of uh, a couple's borrowing capacity. These relaxations of financial market deregulation, combined with strong population growth, a tightening in the supply of greenfield sites on the metropolitan fringe, and lower interest rates to underpin repeated bursts of house price inflation. These have taken house prices in real terms to ever higher levels relative to incomes. As a result, Home buyer affordability has deteriorated despite the generally lower interest rates that we're now experiencing relative to the 1970s. According to the Australian Bureau of Statistics Survey of Income and Housing, the average home buying household in the lowest two quintiles of the income distribution was spending 19.19% 19 .19 of their gross household income on their mortgage payments back in 1982. By 2013, that share had increased to 30%. The proportion spending more than 30% of their income on housing costs rose from 27.9% to 48.1% in the, in the, over the same period. Those uh, deteriorating affordability trends are correlated with declining home ownership rates. Those declines have now set in for all age groups other than the over 65s and are particularly pronounced among young Australians. Part of the housing affordability problem can be attributed to the slow growth of wages and hence household incomes in recent times and the rise in precarious and casual employment. Many blame these developments on deregulation of housing of Australian labour markets. A very important part of the unusual Australian welfare system has been intervention in labour markets to deliver benefits normally associated with the welfare state. So, for example, workers' compensation, sick pay, as well as the living wage through the award system. These are all protections provided through interventions in the Australian labour market, but they've been progressively weakened over the last 30 years or so. One of the more inter important interventions of this kind was the introduction in 1992 of the superannuation guarantee. As already mentioned, it obliges employers of eligible employees to contribute 9.5% of employees' earnings into a complying pension fund. This has had potentially important implications for the Australian housing system. As the superannuation guarantee system has matured, unoccupied housing's importance as an asset supporting income in retirement has diminished. It's no longer critical to be debt free when approaching retirement because most 
who are now approaching retirement have accumulated balances in their superannuation accounts. It's perhaps no coincidence, therefore, that mortgage indebtedness has increased across the board and to levels relative to GDP that are higher than in most other OECD countries. Indebtedness has grown especially sharply amongst mature age Australians. According to the Australian Household Income and Labour Dynamics Survey, in the 50 to 60 year age group, a little over one in four owners were still paying down mortgages in 2001. But by 2017, there are now more than one in two. And among males, it was approaching 60%. There are coincident changes in labour market behaviour. Among mature age homeowners, labour force participation rates have risen by 10 percentage points, from 70% to 80% among 50 to 60 year olds. Female labour force participation rates have climbed even more strongly, from 60% in 2001 to roughly 75% in 2017 again in that 50 to 60 year age bracket. So instead of approaching the age pension eligibility age debt free, there are now growing numbers of Australian owners approaching these age with outstanding mortgage loans. And they are planning or compelled to work longer in order to pay them off. That's one important way in which the traditional linear Australian housing career has broken down. There's another one, the emergence of the so-called generation, re gen generation rent cohort. Younger Australians that are staying longer in the parental home and remaining in private rental housing to later stages in their housing careers. And there are those arguing that we could be witnessing an increasing number of lifetime renters. Yet another disruption disruption to linear housing careers is evidence of a breakdown in the ownership housing ladder amongst those caught on the edges of home ownership. It seems that a sizable minority of home, home buyers and homeowners fall off the home ownership ladder, especially those who've experienced biographical disruption, divorce, separation, widowhood, and also loss of employment. This phenomenon appears to be more common in Australia than in the UK. So let me now turn to the COVID-19 uh, crisis. As Australia entered 2020, it had falling home ownership rates and, own and ownership careers much transformed from those 30 years ago. The public, ha public health crisis precipita precipitated by COVID is a serious economy-wide shock. Initially, there were hopes of a V-shaped recession, sharp contraction, followed by an equally sharp recovery. But as the crisis has unfolded, those hopes have withered and been replaced by expectations of a slow and prolonged recovery, during which we're likely to see double digit unemployment rates and underemployment rates that could reach even higher levels. These expectations pose a threat to housing market stability because of the implications for household incomes of those affected. But let me begin my thoughts on those threats by noting a number of stabilizers that could go some way to neutralize those threats and some differences in those stabilizers between Australia and the UK. The first is an automatic stabiliser. <clears throat> Most owners that are seeking to sell a property can actually withdraw it if they don't like the price they are being offered and continue to live in it. Housing therefore differs from most other assets in this regard. Owners of shares and bonds, for example, cannot consume those financial assets when markets plunge. This feature of owner-occupied housing acts as a platform that can help to support house prices and market stability during downturns. Both the Australian and UK governments have introduced wage subsidy programmes. The two programmes, called JobKeeper in Australia, 
differ in ways that could have important differential impacts in housing markets. In Australia, employees of eligible businesses receive a flat rate $1,500 per fortnight. In the UK, furloughed employees are paid 80% of their wages, up to a ceiling of £2,500. In Australia, <coughs> it means that some low wage and especially part-time workers will have higher incomes than when working. And so Australia, the Australian programme will likely offer more support to those most at risk of mortgage default, that is low income home buyers. However, there is a caveat there in that the Australian scheme does have important gaps in it. For example, casual workers employed less than 12 months. The Australian government has also doubled the unemployment benefit, now called Job Seeker Allowance, and that will be much appreciated amongst a group that has seen their real incomes fall to very low levels. Now, it's just been reported, uh, in fact, uh, this morning, I'm talking here Friday morning, by <coughs> the ANU's Centre for Social Research and Methods. They're conducting a longitudinal survey of uh, 3,500 Australian households from before the onset of the shutdown. And they're reporting some very interesting findings on income distribution in Australia from February through to May. This morning's report indicates that, in fact, from the 60th percentile of the income distribution and downwards, uh, after-tax weekly income is actually increasing. In the lowest decile, it's increased in Australia by 39%. From the 60th percentile of the income distribution upwards, after-tax weekly incomes are falling by around 20% in the highest decile. So these two measures combined, the Job Keeper Allowance and the Job Seeker Allowance, these are both having major impacts on the income distribution uh, in Australia, at least according to that uh, research that I'm citing uh, that published this morning. Another potentially important stabiliser is the offer by Australian banks to defer mortgage repayments for up to six months and for mortgage holders that are facing financial hardship. They're also willing to negotiate other hardship variation to the terms of loans, including extending the term of loans. Those mortgagors who take out loans at more than 80% of home values will typically also have mortgage insurance, though those insurance products typically protect the banks and not the borrower. Finally, labour force participants are being permitted as a temporary measure to dip into their superannuation balances before reaching preservation age, the preservation age being the age you must reach before being able to make drawdowns. That preservation age has been relaxed and those now below their, their the preservation age, which was 55 years now being progressively increased, those below the pre pre uh, preservation age are allowed to dip into their superannuation balances, though there are caps on the amount that can be drawn down. It is a potential buffer for home buyers with a steady record of employer. Now the job keeper allowance, as well as the doubling of the unemployment benefit, are scheduled to end in September. And banks mortgage deferral terms will be coming to an end at about this time as well. Even before this transpire, tra transpires, digital finance analytics estimate that the number of households experiencing mortgage stress climbed by 100,000 to 1.4 million in April. If the economy's recovery is slow and protracted, then housing and mortgage markets could fall off the cliff if and when those supports are abruptly removed. And indeed, in some respects, Australia is more exposed to that risk as there's no safety net in the social security system. In the UK, there's been a long history of help to unemployed buyers 
with meeting mortgage payments after a waiting period has elapsed. As the September deadline approaches, we will have a better idea of the strength of the Australian economy's recovery. If the signals continue to suggest a slow path to recovery, then it is to be hoped that government will avoid precipitous change to JobKeeper and JobSeeker programmes. We can be perhaps more optimistic on that count, given the recently reported overestimation by the government of the JobKeeper's budget cost. Well, those are short-term considerations. What might in the longer run, what might eventuate in the longer run? Well, allowing home buyers access to superannuation makes explicit the trade-off between home ownership and pensions that the housing studies academics Kemeny and Castles alerted us to in the 1980s. There is the possibility that generation rent may in actual fact be banking on their superannuation balances and also inheritances to fund late entry into home ownership. And that late entry into home ownership is attractive to generation rent because of the because of the concessions on age pensions and age care that I mentioned earlier. So we might see an inversion to the typical housing career with instead of Australians entering home ownership as soon as possible and then quickly paying down mortgages, we may see increasing numbers of Australians making late entries into home ownership on the back of their accumulated superannuation balances and inheritances, which are also typically received by people in their 50s, given increasing longevity in the Australian population. Typically, products in mortgage markets shift most of the risk burden onto leveraged home buyers. So home buyers take a haircut if house prices plunge. They must also cut spending on other needs if interest rates rise. Might it now be time for financial institutions to introduce innovative mortgage products that ensure that mortgagees, that is banks, share in the risk burden? These types of risk products have been championed by Robert Schiller in the United States and Susan Smith in the UK. Their risk sharing features might be especially attractive in turbulent economic conditions. And those turbulent economic conditions are likely to eventuate in the future. Fiscal concessions, and in the view of many industry bodies, planning systems, can, can play an important role in destabilising housing markets. Reform of the taxation of housing is long overdue. The arrangements are widely believed to be inequitable and also the source of inefficiencies in housing markets. There is relatively low hanging fruit here, the removal of stamp duties and their replacement by a uniform land tax will improve access to home ownership by using borrowing constraints, but could also ensure a more efficient residential land market. Well, I feel as I've taken up more of your time than uh, I deserve to. So let me now finish there. Thank you for your uh, for listening. <laughs>